Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts with the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> Because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. The word of the Lord. Praise to 
so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey. When God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which is prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and as at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. Receive 
because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father. And I will love them and reveal myself to them. The Gospel of the Lord. Now, there are two studies. One is the gift, singular, of the Holy Spirit. 
The other is the gifts, plural, of the Holy Spirit, which were manifest among those early churches, and I believe can be manifest among new congregations today, especially in the third world. However, I want you to know that the gift of the Holy Spirit is not something strange, although Peter said, what you see and hear is happening, this, this can also be yours. It is something practical. It is something we can put our teeth into. And that's what Paul is talking about here. When I place on the forehead the prison oil of anyone whom I baptize, young or old, I say you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise and made to be Christ's own forever. It's something that will never go away, no matter what. Notice the second sentence. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through His Spirit that dwells in you. Did you know that the Holy Spirit is the power behind the future resurrection that we talk about all the time? If we have that Spirit within us, then we will be raised from the dead. Period. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what Paul is saying here. Now, I'm going to ask you three questions along this way, and they're all the same question. I'm going to ask you well, the same question three times. Does this sound like something temporary to you? Does this sound like Paul is talking only to the church at Rome and not to us? Hold your answer. Look at the middle one. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, and that's an interesting word, Abba, it's equivalent to our dada, or daddy, because it's the first uh, multiple syllable word the Aramaic children said when they sat on their daddy's lap. Yes, we could translate it as daddy father. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. How can this be? Doesn't God already know that we are children of God? Why does the Holy Spirit have to bear witness with my spirit that I am a child of God? I'll tell you, I don't know. But I can tell you this also. If Paul says it happens, that means it must be pretty important. And I accept that, and I celebrate it, and I rejoice in it. It is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If, in fact, we suffer with Him. There's that suffering again. Like Paul said that I quoted last week, I rejoice in my sufferings for, you, for the afflictions of body, of the body of Christ, which is the church. He fills up on, on His suffering to match that of Jesus. If in fact we suffer with Him, so that we may also be glorified with Him. All right, second question, same question, second time. Does this sound like something temporary to you? Just written to the church at Rome, or just written to the Christians who might read this at the time? Hold that answer. Now look at the last one. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Now, you know and I know that we know some folks who don't like to admit weaknesses at all. Are you aware that the writer of Hebrews says that high priests are chosen from among men in the translation that we have? who are surrounded by weakness so that they can bear gently with the ignorant and the erring? Whoa! I, I submit to you that I'm highly qualified to be a priest because I am surrounded by weakness. 
And it's only under those circumstances that I can deal gently with those who are also surrounded by weakness. And that's why God brings priests into relationship with him. And I'm talking about clergy now. The only reason I'm called a priest is what I do behind that altar and reenacting the sacrifice of Christ. For we do not know how to pray as we ought. That's our weakness. Now, I'm not talking about the typical Episcopalian is that I don't know how to word a prayer. I'm talking about how do you get a tangible voice with meaning up to an infinite God? That's a, a pretty difficult thing to get your head around. It's like a trinity. How can three be one and one be three? That shouldn't be a stumbling block for you. You should, you should be happy that the God that we worship cannot be totally understood. That's a difference between infinite and finite. But we don't know how to pray that we ought, as we ought, but that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. I have um, one sermon which I entitled God is a God of intercession. Just as your father or your mother might have been with someone else, maybe the other, to argue your case when you were a kid. That's intercession. And in that same chapter, Romans 8, Paul also says that Jesus intercedes for us. So in this one chapter, the Holy Spirit is interceding for us. Jesus is interceding for us. That's two members of the Trinity, to the Godhead, asking Jesus, or asking God, rather, the Father, to forgive us our sins, to recognize us as being in the family, to bring us home to glory. That's pretty good power. And if that's what it takes for my prayers to get to God, I accept that. With sighs too deep for words. And God who searches the heart knows what is in the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Does that sound like something temporary to you? Does that sound like Paul saying to the church of Rome, this is true of you but not anybody else? If you're wondering why I'm asking that question three times, turn your page over and I'll show you. Now, for those of you who remember the red letter editions of the Bible, usually it was a big family Bible with gold edges and thumb index and maybe white, maybe black, thick, where you recorded all the uh, new births and marriages and everything. The side we just did in that Bible would be black. The side that we're about to do now is all red. These are the statements of Jesus. Listen to them carefully. This is the one I just read to you from the Gospel book. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of Truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. This is a promise made not just to the apostles, but to all of us. The second one. But the advocate, or it could be comforter, by the way, uh, the Greek word for advocate or comforter is paraclete. Paraclete is made up of two root words, cleat, which resembles the word to call, to yell at, and para, which means next to or beside, like parallel. That word is still used in Greece today by swimming coaches who, with a megaphone, yell words of encouragement when their swimmers come up to take a breath of air. They are paracletes. They are comforters. They are people who can keep you on track and keep you motivated. That's what the Holy Spirit is if he is in us. But the advocate, the second one, the Holy Spirit, 
whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Indeed, the apostles were going to go out and preach the word. You know, sometimes Jesus said, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still don't understand? Well, here's a verse that acknowledges that and says that Jesus is going to be with those who proclaim the gospel, and they will be able to remember, they will be able to bring forth what Jesus has said. Look at the third one. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. What does that mean? I'll tell you, I don't know. But I think it has to do with the fact that the world is going to understand that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. And I accept that. I reminded you last week of Fleming Rutledge and her book, The Red, uh, Crucifixion, and how she said, listen to me well, if Jesus Christ was not raised from the dead, we would never have heard his name. Well, the fact that he was raised from the dead, the fact that we have now heard his name, the fact that we recognize it as the name above all names, is partly due to the power and the instrumentality of the Holy Spirit testifying to the world. The next one. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Whoa. Are you listening to that? I'm going to read it again. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, says it's to your advantage that I go away. Why? Because if I do not go away, the advocate, that paraclete, will not come to you. If you want a verse that talks about the importance of the Holy Spirit in your life, consider that one. Jesus said, I have to go. If I don't go, you won't get the Holy Spirit, which is what this whole thing is going to be about through the centuries. I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. That has to do with conscience. It has to do with preaching. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It has to do with God speaking to us in various and sundry ways. The way the writer of Hebrews starts out his epistle. Could be dreams, could be visions, could be tragedies, could be low times in our lives when we're open more to what the Spirit would say to us. He will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. And then the last one. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. Now, to me, that implies that they haven't yet had all the truth. Give you pregnant pause there. If that's not what it means, what would it mean? He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak on His own, that will speak whatever he hears and he will declare it to you, to you, the things that are to come. In another letter, Paul tells us to strive, to keep, to persevere the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now, if the New Testament church didn't have disagreements, we could say, let's be like them. But they had disagreements. And they had disagreements after the ascension of Jesus. Throughout the century and centuries, the church will look for truth. And those items that we disagree on the most simply sometimes are not totally represented by verses that we can go to. We like to think we can argue and prove things, but sometimes we just can't. The older I get, the less I know for sure, the more sure I am of it. <laughs> Throughout the centuries, the church has had to make decisions, and I'm just going to give you a minuscule number here on these topics. Infant baptism, Women priests, 
prohibition. Undocumented aliens. The Nicene Creed. Are you aware that there was a group of folks early in the third, fourth uh, century who started saying that scoundrels who were priests were not affected. If they pronounced a blessing or if they married a, a, a couple, it didn't count because they were sinners. The Nicene Creed is one of those things that came about because of these heresies that were creeping into the church. And that's why we repeat it every Sunday. We are faced with LGBTQ questions. There are complexities in that, as in all issues that come before the church, that come before the family. Abortion. Marriage, divorce, and remarriage. How about the um, offense of conscience? Paul says there's something so delicate about that that he will stop doing some things like eating meat to idols to avoid offending someone. I owe it to um, a great old preacher of my youth who said that Paul said we should not offend the ones who are offended. But that didn't mean that we shouldn't offend the grumblers. Jesus offended a lot of people with the truth. In this spiritual world, which we cannot see, each of God's creations has a realm. I'm going to oversimplify it, but you'll know what I mean by it. With the animals, the realm is the earth. With birds, it's the sky. With fish, it's the sea, or the lake, or the river. What is it with us? If, if we are made in the image of God, what's our realm? There are those who would argue, if not by their language, at least by their lives, that our realm is planes, trains, automobiles, and internet. And, as I mentioned also last week, gaining the most toys, and therefore we win at the end of our lives. Is that really our realm? I suggest to you, good people, that our realm is the spiritual world. And if we don't acknowledge that, if we don't incorporate that, if we don't find our place in it, then we are as foolish as the pig who tries to fly, as the fish who tries to walk. And in your heart of hearts, you know that to be the case. Like E.T., there's something in us that calls us home. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. You know that's good news, and you know that the Spirit of God is a part of it. And you know that these words spoken to the apostles and to the church at Rome are not just temporary, but alive and well now. I remember one time when I stood up in the largest uh, congregation of my folks in St. Louis, the, the church on Skinker Boulevard, right across from Forest Park. And there were a whole bunch of folks in the seats. I said for the first time, I was in my 20s, I said for the first time, the Holy Spirit is alive and well and living in me.
and they received it. Now there was another group I said that to that I think I've already mentioned to you. They did not receive it well. But I say it to you. And if you want to know how to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, I suggest to this, this to you. Number one, don't be offended unless some church leader asks you to violate your conscience. And number two, don't demand agreement on the part of anybody else to what you're saying. I'm not asking you to believe all of this. What I am asking you is number three, and that is with peace and love to come to the altar together. In my opinion, that's the only way to have the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Splitting up the denominations cannot be God's plan for preserving the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. That means listening to him. That means taking seriously where the church has come from and where the church is going. That means being patient when we work out an issue that may take us 10 or 20, 30 years, but still coming to the altar together in the love of God. That's good news. I share it with you this morning in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's stand and say the nice creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Lord, the Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternal God and God. God of God, light of light, true God of true God, the God of not made, of one way of love. Through him all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became the Lord of the Virgin Mary and was made in For our sake, he was crucified on the Pontius Pilate. He suffered and death and was buried on the third day. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of God. He will come again in glory to judge us living out of the dead, and his kingdom will have an end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, and his worship is glorified. He has spoken of the cross. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge the baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the Lord of God. Amen. The seven prayers of the people. Oh my God, we celebrate the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Savior. We rejoice and offer our prayers and thanksgiving, saying, Thanks be to God. We pray for your universal church that it may proclaim the good news of the risen Christ to the world. We pray especially for Michael, our presiding bishop, Shannon, our bishop. Thanks be to God. We pray for our nation, state, and community that your will for all people will be realized. We pray especially for Joe, our president of the United States the members of Congress, and John Bell, our governor. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for, the magnific for your magnificent creation. Lead us to be worthy stewards in caring for and sustaining your gifts. Thank you, Lord. We give you thanks for our parish congregation and those we love, especially Dean Benko, who celebrates her birthday this week. Let us and protect them and lead them into a deeper life with you. We pray for those known and unknown to us who are ill, mourn, or suffer in any way, especially Helen, Ron and Dean, Joan, Carla, Betsy, Bill, Andrew, Melinda, 
Jack, Shelly, Seth, Lynn, Frank, and Cindy. Be merciful and grant them peace and wholeness. Thanks. 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 We thank you for our departed loved ones and pray we all may share in the resurrection and eternal life with you. We pray especially for Rhonda, Edward, and William. Let light perpetual shine upon them. Father Almighty, grant that the resurrection of your Son, which broke through the darkness and destroyed death, may lead us to new life and empower us to service and praise. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
light and ever living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual truth of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do your work that you have given us to do, to love and serve you, Holy Spirit. To him and you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Amen. May Almighty God, who has redeemed us and made us his children through the resurrection of his Son, our Lord, bestow upon you the riches of his blessing. Amen. May God who through the water of baptism has raised us from sin into newness of life, make you holy and worthy to be united with Christ forever. Amen. May God, who has brought us out of bondage to sin into true and lasting freedom and the Redeemer, bring you to your eternal inheritance. Amen. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever.